Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PCMA webinar series. We are here today on a Tuesday afternoon, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can see our distinguished uh, guests here, Nick Barashev and David Morgan and Brian Kosak, co uh, hosting this as well and moderating it, our PCMA executive. Uh, director, here we are, are, Georgina Blandis. I am not Georgina Blandis, I am Jackie Serrett. Uh, welcome again, the Private Capital Markets Association presenting um, precious metals uh, and situation that we uh, find ourselves in here uh, due to uh, the pandemic of COVID-19. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Brian Kostick over here to uh, give a brief introduction and allow Nick and David to introduce themselves. Dave, Brian, please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. We're really excited to have you here, and we're really excited about the two awesome guests we have. Um, things are changing. Uh, we're all reading in the paper. Um, things are changing in more ways than one. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, amongst other things, about a four-letter word that uh, we are getting more used to, and that four-letter word is gold, G-O-L-D, and other precious metals. And uh, we have two experts. Uh, boy, if I, I would probably spend five minutes reading each of their bios. They're so accomplished and uh, very, very skilled and knowledgeable about their areas. But I'm going to ask each of them if they can give us just a brief uh, intro about who they are. And the question I always ask, Nick and David, tell us one thing about yourself that not even your friends know. Nick, let's start off with you. Who are you? Introduce yourself to PCMA Nation here. Uh, well, thank you. Um, well, uh, as you said, I'm I'm CEO of BMG, and the thing is that I started BMG in 1998, uh, and it took us four years to get the prospectus cleared through the Ontario Securities Commission. And I, I was thinking I'd work at this for five, ten years, and then retire and go sailing in the BVI. Well, here it is 22 years later, and I'm not retired, but I'm glad I'm not sailing in the BVI because the sailors there uh, aren't allowed to land at any of the islands because of COVID. So might not have been a good thing after all. <laughs> so, Nick, it looks like, like you got into gold because you saw that the dot com was going to bust in 99. Like, wow, you were just ahead of the time. Well, it wasn't so much the dot com was going to bust, but like gold was uh, had had gone sideways and down for quite a long time, and I thought it was due for for a correction. And in Canada, there there was no way to buy uh, bullion, gold, silver, platinum in the registered retirement savings account. So I wanted to set up something that wouldn't compromise any of the fundamental attributes of bullion, uh, which meant a, a, an open-end fund, which traded in and out of the, of the markets. Uh, but that had never been done. And like I say, it took, took four years and six different exemption requests to finally get it approved in 2002. So I think they just got tired of me pestering them. Yeah. Well, Nick, uh, we're really happy to have you because you, you've written so much. You've been on BNN and other these other shows. Um, people just listening to what you have to say. I know you wrote a book called 10,000 Gold. Uh, we'll get into that later um, because uh, that is coming up. If you start Googling it again, uh, again, ahead of your time there. So, Nick, before we uh, pass it on to David, what's one thing that – your friends would uh, like to know about you that they don't know about you. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I thought long and hard. It was, it was probably the, uh, the the my passion, you know, for boating and particularly in the BVI, which oh. uh, unfortunately may may never come back again. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Wow, uh, boater. Okay, excellent, David. Welcome. Thank you for participating. So uh, why don't we start off with you. Tell us a little bit about your background. I see that you do the Morgan Report and uh, no relation to JP Morgan, but I'm sure it's better subject matter wise because you are an expert in the field. David, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. 
Well, I was fascinated about with money at an early age, and I ran across the idea that you could, uh, re you know, could be an investor, could be like a, a career. You know, I didn't know much about financial world. That's I was probably about 11 years old. Anyway, one thing led to another, self-studied, found out how the banking system worked at a very early age, and then I started getting into the gold-silver situation because of that. And I uh, decided with the internet, it was probably time to go ahead and launch my own uh, research service, which I did. And it's been on the web for about 22 years. Met Nick very early on, attracted a lot of people. Uh, so wait, David, are you telling us that you were like a blogger and podcaster before it was even Vogue? <laughs> yeah, in fact, I actually sent out by hand mail uh, the whole ideal idealism of me about the Federal Reserve being a private banking corporation. And I did that on my own dime just to inform people. And I got a letter from the Postmaster General. Uh, didn't say cease and desist because everything I said was referenced and backed up. But it was like, we don't want to know about this. So now everybody <laughs> on the net knows that the Fed's a private corporation. But when I was like 18, 19 years old and started on this quest, no one very few knew it and those that did know it had to you know prove it i mean most people just you know big conspiracy you don't know what you're talking about that type of attitude wow. anyway it's been my passion for a long time i i consult write the morning report i speak all over the world i've written three books and i still carry that fire in the belly and i know the next question is what do uh something about me that even my friends don't know some of my friends know a lot of them don't and it's going to be a three-part answer, but I swam against Mark Spitz, who is the uh, Michael Phelps wow. of my era at the Santa yeah. Clara County Invitational Swim Center when I was 17 years old. And my qualifying time in the freestyle was fast enough to actually swim in the heat that he was in. They had three heats. Uh, I came in wow. sixth. He went to the Olympics and I went home. But I've always really loved being around the water in a different way than Nick. But my big passion from, oh, 20s through 30s, <clears throat> mid-30s, was scuba diving. I just love it. Nice. I love to be on Nick's boat in the BVIs, and uh, he can uh, make lunch, and I'll go diving for a couple hours. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny here. <laughs> Got a smile out of Nick. And, um, and that's actually my older age has uh, morphed into kayak. So I've always wanted to be in, on, or nice. by the water for some reason. So I sort of didn't know what Nick was going to say, but I guess we got two people that uh, like being around the water. Awesome. Well, we'll segue from Aqua into a PowerPoint presentation. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Jackie to take direction from Nick. And Nick, um, just to get ourselves all organized here, you're going to do a brief presentation with David about uh, certain matters involving gold and precious metals, and then we're going to stop, ask you six questions, and then time permitting, we'll open it up for questions from uh, the attendees. So, Nick, over to you. Let's get going here. Okay. Well, uh, this PowerPoint, um, and we can go right to the next slide, Jackie, um, um, came about a few years ago because uh, you could see that, that we were in a triple bubble already before COVID. Uh, the markets were going to crash um, and real estate and most major markets like Toronto and Vancouver were overvalued. So this is the first time that I've been in business that there was a simultaneous triple bubble in stocks, bonds and real estate. So I thought it was inevitable that that was going to happen with COVID-19 and, and the shutdown of, of all the businesses, it made matters much worse. So the first chart we look at, it compares the performance of gold uh, against all the S&P sectors. So there isn't in any sector that, that ha has performed at all uh, other than gold. And this is one of the areas that, that um, that I've, I've been emphasizing on that if people have the patience and step back from investing, you don't need to be invested when the market looks like this, this kind of volatility, this kind of loss. It's much better to wait. And then when the market finishes correcting, then invest. It'll be the biggest opportunity in your lifetime. But most many people still prefer to stay invested. Now in the second chart, next one, 
it compares um, the uh, the Canadian banks because they are considered to be a, a safe investment and you know rock solid and so on, but there isn't a Canadian bank that looks looks any good, and this is just the beginning. Now, if we go to the next chart, hey, this looks like the same graph you just presented to us. <laughs> In terms of uh, gold's here and everyone else is down. Right. So, but this chart shows compares the, you know, the 1929 crash, the 2000 crash, the 208 crash, and so on. So we've gone down about 18 percent, which is the red line. And you know the 86% down is the 1929 crash, and we put together a uh, audio CD of of probably about 20 of the world's top financial experts, and many of them were predicting that uh, this correction is going to be worse than 29. So from this, you can see we've got a long way to go. Uh, the next chart also gives you another indication of, of uh, gold versus the uh, other asset classes. And again, it is the only thing that's positive. And the next chart, and this is probably the chart that people um, know the least. This is the gold price in all the different currencies in every year. And, and you can see that the, the average uh, over the entire period is a is 11.4 percent a year. Now, as an example, most pension funds target six percent in their portfolio, but they could have just bought gold and they would have got 11 percent on average. And in, in Canada, it was nine percent. U.S. was 9.75. And most people find that hard to hard to believe that gold has done this well when a, a, a good part of this uh, it, and it wasn't doing great and didn't have a good reputation during that time. But 10% over the last 20 years isn't that bad. Um, if you look at gold internationally, uh, this next chart shows gold against the uh, various international equity indexes. And again, every one of them is down and gold priced in that country's currency is up dramatically. And, and so you can see that the, this, this isn't uh, something that, that's restricted to any one country or any one currency, it's right across the board. In, in the last chart, this gives you a a visual uh, indication of both bull and bear markets. Do we have the next chart? So you can see visually this chart shows you the, 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 the height and the depth of the various bull and bear markets. And, and you can see that this last one uh, lasted the longest, 129 months and is the second highest in history. So usually when you have a, a bull market that's of that magnitude, you have a bear market equally bad. And this is what we're heading into. And this would have happened with or without uh, the coronavirus. This was all set up to happen regardless. And this, this shows uh, visually the magnitude of that. The next chart, this is something that's, that's a bit of an anomaly. People don't understand that, for example, if you lose 10% of your portfolio, you have to have an 11% gain. It's not too bad, but if you lose 50%, you need a 100% gain. So if you stay invested and lose 50%, you're probably not going to live long enough for a 100% gain. And the last chart just shows you some of the previous uh, 
correction, the magnitude of them. And, and you can see that in each case, gold is negatively correlated uh, to the S&P 500. So each time there was a significant correction, uh, gold either held its own or went up um, proportionately. So that, that just gives a brief overview of where we sit uh, today. And, and like I say, I, I think that the market was going to correct regardless. And, and the amount of money that the Fed was already printing was, was enormous. The debt was enormous. Uh, but now, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's lost count as to how much money is going to get printed. The money that's being printed, unfortunately, doesn't do anything for the economy because the money is being printed to pay people not to work. So there's no contribution to GDP out of, out of this new money. When, when they let the companies open and, and, and hopefully get back to business, they'll have to print an enormous amount more uh, to, to give them the boost they need to become successful. So the, the printing is just getting started as far as I'm concerned. Very interesting, uh, very interesting comments, Nick. Um, are we uh, continuing on slides? Uh? No, that's all the slides for now. Okay, fantastic. That just uh, sets the perfect. That was uh, that was a great backstory in terms of where we're at um, and seeing how gold fits into uh, one's portfolio. And um, you know, obviously, uh, Nick, you've been doing this uh, a long time. Um, I, you know, this is uh, your book that's on the screen now. Um, just uh, can they buy that on Amazon, Nick? Is, can they get it yeah, there as well? Yeah, it's on Amazon plus a number of other services. And then we've also created an, an audio CD so people can buy the audio CD. And there's a number of streaming services that offer it yeah. as well. Well, I think what your thesis uh, clearly demonstrates is that um, people should look at where gold fits in their portfolio, other precious metals, including silver. So at this point, let me jump into some of our questions. So, um, you know, should people stay invested? Do markets seem to be poised to fall much farther uh, in your opinion? Now, I just want to be clear for our audience that uh, neither of you portfolio managers are providing them, you know, individual um, advice in terms of uh, what they should be doing or otherwise. These are just high level comments. Um, Generally, so um, Nick and David, um, what's your thoughts? Well, um, my my thinking is is that the the mantra of always staying invested um, doesn't apply in conditions like this. It, it's a lot more sensible to take your chips off the table and and wait. Could be months, even if it's years and wait, and then when the market's finished correcting, then you invest. And you, you can be buying things anywhere from 50 to 70% off. And, and when you invest at a low like that, you'll have spectacular performance. In the meantime, you, you stay in gold because gold will go up as it always has uh, while the market corrects. So that's the thing. The problem is that most portfolios do not have any gold in them. Uh, my latest numbers are something like half of 1% is what the allocation of gold is. It's next to nothing. And, and on a normal basis, the allocation should be 10 to 20%. I'm saying now, which is totally contrary in attitude right now, you should be 100% gold. It's real money. So stay, stick to money for the moment and, and until the dust settles and we know where things are going. Yeah, interesting. I know that, um, you know, some people are saying, um, should I stay, should I go into cash? Uh, should I go into cash, you know, lever up and jump in the next pop in the market because everything's going to go up. I think this market activity has been interesting in terms of you had a little bit uh, a blip up 
But this, this, you know, in, in my opinion, I'm not an analyst, is this is just beginning, it's not over. But I think what you're saying is um, you should look at gold and it would probably fit in your portfolio. You know, obviously make sure it's suitable, but you know, it's it's all about the gold thesis. But let's extend that to maybe some other precious metals. David, any comments? Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that question, let's say related to silver? Yeah. Well, should people stay invested? The answer is yes, if they're in the right sector. I mean, if you were in the Japanese stocks in the 80s and held 10 years, you were fine. You were in the precious metals, gold stocks or gold from uh, 2000 to 2010, you had a decade. So you have to make a decision every decade. That's the idea. It's not precise, but you are going to witness a much further fall or decline in the overall stock markets. There will be sucker rallies. And most investors are like generals, they fight the last war. So everyone's well aware of how well the stock market did for the last several years. So they think that that is the way to go because they have a history that that was the place to be. Those days are over. Yes, there will be sharp rallies to the upside, but the overall trend is going to be down. As Nick showed in the slide, the weighted average is 46% down. We've only had about a 15, 16% fall so far. So very bearish. On the silver side, uh, it's much more volatile than gold. Certainly hasn't gained the safe haven status that gold has currently. I'm looking pretty much for gold to pull silver up. I think it's a good swap if you're so inclined to maybe, uh, if you're like gold only or overweighted gold, to swap some in the silver market. But uh, silver really has to prove itself. I've been a little disappointed technically on gold making a bottom at the December 2015 uh, point in time, and silver did again with gold. They are 85% correlated, but silver's broken down to a new low recently, and the correlation is also uh, not as strong as it was for many, many decades. So, uh, still bullish, but I think it's going to take gold to lead the way. Great. Well, I, I, okay. My views are, are that so, silver lags gold when we have a broad equity market correction. But, but then it catches up and outperforms gold eventually. And right now, the gold to silver ratio is what, about 110 to one, and where the historical mean is 40 to one. And at 40 to one, the silver price should be about $40 an ounce today instead of 15. So silver has got a lot of catching up to do uh, to get back into to its normal gold silver ratio so as gold rises silver's got to rise by a lot more right now investors been given proper guidance for their portfolios to weather this time i mean i know it's a broad question but um what's your thoughts in terms of um, investor guidance on portfolio management well that that was the big shocker when i started the company i thought wow well, you, you can't buy gold in RSP. So as soon as I got the funds set up, everybody would welcome it and, and you know, allocate 10 to 20% in gold. That never happened because it, I've come to learn that there's almost an irrational negative bias against gold in, in the traditional financial markets. And that's why so little of it is owned today. Uh, most portfolios are 60-40 stock and bond, including the pension portfolios. And the pension portfolios are in a giant problem with unfunded liabilities before this COVID correction. So some of the pension funds are, are in situations that are not resolvable no matter what they do. The, the issue that you could appreciate, Brian, is because uh, eventually, and the, and the lawsuits have already started in California, because uh, the pensioners were given letters that said, uh, from now on, your pension check's going to be 50% of the old one. And that's where the lawsuits start. And the lawsuits are going to sue the actuaries, the pension fund managers, the trustees, everybody because there's absolutely zero justification for having only 60-40 in stocks and bonds and not a fully diversified portfolio. There's no justification whatsoever. And, and they, these people that 
created these disasters in the pensions uh, will will spend their retirement in court. Yeah, well, I've seen. Like um, obviously, recently we've seen. Um, you know, Aimco's uh, investment strategy was recently questioned in terms of some of their um, investments. I know increasingly, um, being the PCMA, uh, pension funds, endowment funds have increasingly allocated to uh, private market securities uh, in terms of their portfolio away from that traditional 60-40. Uh, David, what are your thoughts? I'd like to just back up, Nick. Uh, they commissioned Ibsen and Associates in 2005 to do a study just reading one paragraph, and he mentioned the Sharps ratio. You can look that up on the internet. I talk about it in my book, The Silver Manifesto, and why the market is manipulated. But all that aside, Ibbotson writes, based on forward-looking, resampled, efficient frontiers, the allocations include precious metals and can potentially improve the risk-reward in a conservative, moderate, and aggressive portfolio with precious metals with these allocations, 7%, 12.5%, and 15.7%. It's an absolute fact that you need precious metals to balance a portfolio, but very few are taught that. I know I used to work for a certified financial planner, and being the metals head that I was self-taught, he sort of poo-pooed the idea. Very few in the industry understand the necessity of this. Well, so, David, I got I got to catch up. Like you're saying, you were a metal head. So, just her audience <laughs> understands: is that you're interested in heavy metal, or uh, I know yeah. we're talking precious metals? I need we to catch it. Metal. It's it's one of my in, inside jokes in regard in regard to the importance of precious metals. If you're going to give a legacy investment for a thousand years, there's only really three things that do that. It's gold, real estate, or fine art. If you're thinking, you know, your children's children's children, what could you leave them now that you would be guaranteed would have value in the future? It's really those three things. It's not the S and P 500. It's not an ETF. Right. And this whole thesis about that uh, the silver uh, summit three years ago, Jeff Christian from CPM Group, managing general partner, did a similar study from 1968 onward. And from that point in time, so he picked his starting point till present day, which was three years ago when he gave this slide, that a 25% allocation of gold was actually the best risk reward profile for a balanced portfolio. So again, the point isn't the exact amount. The point is without it, you're basically doomed. And as Nick and I've discussed years before, before it's taking place now, there would be lawsuits around the fact that, well, why didn't you have me position into the precious metals with some appropriate uh, percentage? This is going to be a big deal going forward. Interesting. So I know we talked gold as, as an example. We started off with precious metals. Can you just make sure everyone understands what is the precious metals group so they have a broader understanding? Because I know we're kind of largely focused on uh, gold and silver. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Nick. Well, I, the, the original fund I, I did was uh, gold, silver, platinum. And I didn't include palladium because those the three metals, gold, silver, platinum, have have been used as money throughout history in different countries. So I, I wanted the, only the precious metals that 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 have been used as money. Palladium uh, has done very well recently, uh, but to my knowledge, it, it was never money. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, but again, like let's yeah, go back. back to, why precious to, metals? As I was aware, my background is is real estate and um when i when i was at a la page i did a, a number of re underwritings and and so that that was 30 years ago uh today most uh portfolios do not even have reits in them particularly pension portfolios uh, and reits are kind of similar to real estate buildings uh, but in different market conditions, they act differently. But they're they're convenient and easy to buy and highly liquid. So there's there's again no excuse not to have REITs in a pension portfolio. But none of them do. So where do you see pension funds and pension plans in all this? You want to expand upon that a bit more? Well, it, this is where when when you look at the 
the the magnitude on the unfunded liabilities sooner or later the pension funds are, are going to come to the realization that they should have held gold and that they need to hold gold now but the magnitude of how much they would have to buy would would outstrip the above ground supply with just a few pension funds buying so that that's going to become a, a serious supply problem uh, when when the pension funds get it and and they all assume that they can do this whenever they get around to it but if if they procrastinate they'll be one of the few that won't be able to buy any gold at any price right so can you explain paper gold versus uh, real gold uh, ETFs uh, you know SLV GLD mechanisms of making profit from renting gold. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only so much gold that goes around. There's a lot of these synthetic derivative products that are based on that. I guess, uh, I think I've heard from you one time, uh, if, if everybody was dancing and the music stopped and grabbed a chair, the, the chair being uh, the available gold out there, uh, real gold, um, there'd be like thousands of people standing. Um, maybe you want to explain uh, you know, paper versus real gold. Well, I've just finished an article and, it, and it'll be in this week's Bullion Buzz and it's called The Illusion of Owning Gold and it's largely on the structure of ETFs. Uh, so I've, I'm one of the few guys that reads prospectuses and legal agreements and so on. And if you go through it in detail, uh, you'll, you'll, re you'll realize what the structure is. And, and the structure with ETFs is, is that the assets are borrowed and contributed to the ETF. And just like any borrowed asset, the title to the asset remains with the lender. Uh, so they're just parked in the a ETF for show. But if an authorized participant was to become insolvent, like Lehman Brothers did in 2008, uh, if Lehman Brothers wouldn't wasn't bailed out, then you know ETFs around the world would have collapsed. Because once you remove the authorized participant, you have the original lessor can claim the bullion. So it's much worse than simply the investors not being able to you know take delivery of the bullion. Is that the bullion may get yanked out from under them. And in, in the case of an authorized participant going bankrupt. Now today, we have a couple of major banks, primarily Deutsche Bank, that is teetering on, on the edge. And they've got the biggest derivatives book in the world. They're authorized participants for the GLD. And if they become in, insolvent, it'll be like Lehman Brothers times 100. So the issue is that, that in the GLD, if like you and I wanted to have a bet on tomorrow's gold price, we don't need any gold to have the bet. You just have to be good for the money if you lose and I have to be good for the money if I lose. But owning any gold is irrelevant. That's what the GLD is for. You buy puts or calls, that's it. But it's not about owning gold. And if you read carefully their materials on the front page, It'll say this is in, in order to track the price of gold, not to own gold. Right. So it's like a it's like a derivative play. It's it's synthetic. It's basing off another commodity that changes that's to be right. reflected in the prices. But right. that's not what you do with your asset of last resort. When when uh, things get really bad, you want to make sure the gold is there to to save your 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 portfolio and unfortunately it's going to blow up at exactly the time when people need it the most so if i can be clear because uh, i i know this is what people are are thinking and asking is are you saying that um people are better to own bullion and put it someplace safe as you know like want to put uh, articles in a safety deposit box because most people would say oh, if I should have gold in my portfolio, they'll go buy an ETF or something like that and figure off the figure that they're appropriately covered. Um, what's your thoughts? 
Well, they, the, that's why I set up the funds. So you can buy the funds, and we also sell uh, bullion bars to individuals around the world. And, and you can store them with Brinks. This is for larger amounts. Many of our bullion bar investors have over a million dollars of bullion with us. Um, so it's not something that you want to hide under the mattress. Uh, We're talking like real money. physical bullion. Yeah. Wow, and, okay. And that's, uh, that's a much heavier stock certificate. You're gonna have coins right up to 400 ounce bars. Uh, so we so do that. Uh, it's a, it's a little more cumbersome to buy because we we have to comply with um, money laundering regulations and do do appropriate paperwork and background checks. But once that's through, then then it's simple and um, the, the, you can visit the bullion. You can take delivery of it. You can do whatever you want. We just make it as convenient as possible. Right. Now, uh, we're looking at a book that says 10,000 gold. Why gold's inevitable rise is the investor's safe haven. So uh, I think checked yesterday, gold was like, I don't know, 1,600 and something, an ounce, 10,000. That's a big delta. Um, then looking online and talking about 10,000 gold. And um, I think, you know, you wrote this book a, a few years ago. And uh, at the time, it was like... Um, why is Nick writing this thesis? Where, where's Nick at? And uh, it was compelling. It was uh, um, it, it had a lot of people discussing it. And now when you go online, you're actually seeing articles about 10,000 gold for various reasons. Um, talk to us about why you think that's real. Um, there's articles now appearing on this in terms of the ramifications for the dollar, the price of goods, services, energy. What's going on there that drive up this price from what sixteen hundred dollars something now to what your thesis is is ten thousand gold and which clearly says maybe you should have this in your portfolio well the main the main thesis is that the the price of gold was um totally correlated to u.s total debt and as it continually went up that's how the price of gold went up uh, the, there's other correlations and relationships, but that that was the one. Now, in 2012, the gold price and the U.S. debt diverged, and gold fell off a bit, and now it's catching up. Um, so if that um, relationship was to continue today, the price of gold would have to be about 2200 an ounce right now. Uh, so that's where the catch-up is. When we add the recently printed money, uh, then you, you, you almost get three, four thousand an ounce. Many people are predicting three, three thousand an ounce for the end of the year. Wow, that's 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 interesting. A compelling a compelling thesis. Um, Dave, any further uh, comments, David, on on silver? Uh, I know that's uh, your your sweet spot. Yeah, I agree with what Nick said. I think silver will eventually outperform gold, and it's a smaller market, not only in price, but the availability of it. So, And it's affordable. So if it uh, if the markets go like they did in 1980, and you know what will happen to gold relative to the dollar, price of goods, services, and energy is your last question. Uh, gold in 1979 in November was 300 an ounce. January 21st, 1980 was 850 spot, not 875 in the near futures. So it almost tripled in about a two month time frame. This is the acceleration you see in all markets. It's what happens in the stock market, the tech wreck, the Japanese stocks, they all get accelerated at the end because everybody wants to, has the fear of missing out and they pile into the market. And then when it peaks, there's no buyers left. <clears throat> so you could see where there'll be all kinds of pressures on the dollar because there's so many being printed, but not initially, even though that doesn't make common sense. There's just this big sinkhole of dead money that has to be made up for with the uh, banking system as it stands now. So once that washes through and kind of stabilizes, then the money that's printed from that point on will start inflationary pressures in the monetary system. There are pressures in the physical economy in the food sector, which is the one place that Americans pay attention. When food costs them more, 
So they won't make the equation of whether it's monetary policy, fiscal policy. They don't know anything about that. What they know is it costs them more every time they go to the store. So this will start to get them thinking about what can they do as an inflation hedge. And the best inflation hedge actually is silver. At least that's been proven by Professor Gastrom over years of study. So I'm still bullish. Energy is a tough call. It's you know in the doldrums and everybody won't touch on that. But my point being that gold accelerated and, and silver made a move from November of 1979 to January of 1980, roughly a year and a month, from $6 to $50. So it went up eightfold in one year. And that's, again, the kind of acceleration you can see in these markets. So Jeff Christian actually is the first one to make the statement that 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. So I think Nick is spot on. We agree on almost everything. What's going to happen is there'll be a lot of people that realize that they're late to the party but not too late and they'll start moving the gold market for a variety of reasons these pension managers will say oh my goodness we don't have gold in our portfolio i don't want to get sued i'm going to buy some money managers will say hey the etf doesn't look really that solid to me let me get some physical funds there aren't many like mix available and you're just going to see this what i call run to gold that i think is going to be the biggest run to gold that's ever happened in recorded history because we've never been underweighted as a financial asset in the gold market as we are right now. If you go back to the first bull market in 1970, and it varies, there's no way to get an exact number, but somewhere between one to five percent. Right now we're at about one percent at best, and silver is 0.02 percent of the entire financial assets of the planet. So just think about how many few people would have to buy in the silver market to take something that represents 0.02 percent of the entire financial system to say it takes it to 1%. I mean, so a lot there, but a lot of things will be changing, Brian, as you suggest in your question, as this takes place. There'll be a whole overused word reset on how we do business, on travel, on all kinds of things. And I won't venture out much further than that, just to say to expect great change going forward. So David, oh, sorry. Hey, Brian. So David, so um, which brings us to, um, the title of this this webinar right the perfect storm i mean this is really it really is isn't it and so what we've, what we've learned really is that this is as it's safe to assume then that we're take the takeaways that this is the only asset class that will do well in the foreseeable future right are the are the metals and the precious uh, the particular gold and silver or possibly the platinum so is the silver then the new gold is the question and then you know as we reach this uh mark in the broadcast i'm going to check some questions because there are questions coming in so if you can just comment on that and i'll pop up some questions here okay brian i'll have a look uh david do you mind yeah i just I'll answer that i just have i have one more big picture question that uh, ah. people are burning to, to find an answer to it has to do with uh uh the standstill of mining production and but david uh, ask answer the i guess the question that was posed that'd be great yeah i don't know what's in singapore with mike maloney that was the question will silver be the new gold if gold is reintroduced in the monetary system then it silver would be the only like free trading metal outside of platinum palladium and it could take on that status. I think that it's unlikely that gold will actually be tied to the new monetary system in a direct way. It may be in an indirect way. It's really tough to say. Jim Rickards has very, uh, been pretty vocal about the SDR, and there is some gold in the SDR. But again, it's more as, as Nick has spoken about, that a lot of it has to do with uh, borrowed gold or swap gold or a contract to get gold right. kind of a situation. As far as the mining now, goes. Uh, yeah, like if I just expand on that, David, it's like, you know, when in terms of mining production be at a standstill, we're reading about mining companies, you know, ordering, you know, tens of thousands of uh, COVID testing kits because workers are in close proximity, always uh, fear of getting a COVID or sickness or otherwise. So if you talk to me about, you know, what do you see in terms of the near term for, uh, future? I know uh, you're not a fortune teller, but people are looking at the change in business and mining as a result of this. And really, um, how is it going to impact earnings? Is there going to be uh, uh, an earnings comeback for mining companies? Uh, that's a tough one. Well, <clears throat> the obvious is there. We're going to see a great uh, report here coming out of the mining industry in the next few weeks. They'll report earnings. They'll all be down. For them. I can't think of any that will be up. And of course, there'll be, as things move toward uh, the more normal, 
what you'll see is some marginal mines won't reopen. In other words, if it's a, a conglomerate that has, let's say, four mines and two of them are marginal, if they're all in sustaining costs, management, the board of directors may just decide, you know, those two really aren't that profitable. We're going to focus our attention on these two. So I think the supply not only will be disrupted because of the CV-19 situation, but I think when things do return to, again, quote unquote, normal, that you'll see a shift. Again, it goes bigger than that for silver because 70% is a result of copper, lead, zinc, and gold mining. And there isn't the demand for the copper stream or lead and zinc that there was, let's say, when China was building out. So that will contribute to a negative factor as far as the amount of silver taken out of the ground it is not demanded as much because of everything slowing down, but it is essential, just like oil. There's more uses for silver than any other commodity on the planet except oil. So it's absolutely imperative, essential, a must for so many applications. Anything electrical or electronic requires silver. There is no substitute. So as we go forward in a technological advanced society, you're going to see where silver is absolutely required and i don't want any of the gold bugs mad at me i consider myself to be one but if you had x amount of money and you could only mine gold or silver you would mine silver and i'm saying that as objectively as i can because gold although it's known as money as jp morgan no relation said there's gold is money and everything else is credit but all that aside if you needed to keep your society going and you only had could get one element out of the ground, you would choose silver, not gold. All right. Brian, right. I'm going to ask some okay, questions well, here, if you don't uh, mind. Yeah, this ends uh, this formal part of the presentation. And sorry, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie now. We're going to have yes. our lightning round of questions for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. So Jackie, take it away. Thank you. Yes. OK, so we do, David and Nick, we do have some really great questions that have come in from the attendees registered here on this webinar. And, you know, we may have answered them already. They may have joined in a little bit later and didn't hear them. So I'm just going to read the ones that are outstanding here. Uh, we do have one that's right off the back of what you just said, David. Um, when this is for Miriam, when may we expect silver to break out? We had to see silver above about 1850 for at least three days in a row on above average volume. And when that happens, that's when you'll know. Okay. I uh, hope that helps you, Miriam. Uh, we have a question from Chris, and this is for Nick. For BMG investors in Canada who hold BMG bullion funds through RSP, could you paint a picture about an extreme scenario? where a mainstream bank through which the investor manages his or her BMG portfolio were to close or shut down or fail or go bankrupt? Um, uh, that's, that's hard to, to say right now in, in the current in, in environment. It's, it's almost like uh, anything's possible. Uh, so we're, we're keeping an eye on our partners that we deal with very carefully. Um, some people might have seen that Scotia is intending to um, close their precious metals business and Scotia was the um, biggest uh, uh, market in, in terms of selling bullion in Canada. So these are these are some of the variables that are coming into play uh, with with the uncertainty. Right. Well, Chris, I hope that uh, helped you a little bit. You should reach out and find out um, um, research on your own there. Uh, we have another question here, maybe to both of you, possibly Nick, you want to start with this one. What are the key advantages and disadvantages of holding physical gold over ETFs? Well, the, the, the issue is, is you, know, you need to have bullion because there's no guarantee that that bullion in the, in the ETF is a theirs that it hasn't been leased, um, and and when you've got counterparty dependency, that defeats the the very fundamental purpose of bullion. When mm. you hold physical bullion, there's no counterparty. You're not depending on anybody to do anything. Uh, where the ETF, there there are many vulnerabilities between the trustee, the custodian, the authorized participants, and so on, plenty of things to go wrong. Okay, Ed, I hope that helped you with your question. Um, 
here's another one from Umberto. It has been said that it is not that gold goes up, but that the USD goes down. What is the correlation to this? Well, well that, that's true. It's, it's not that gold has been rising. Uh, if, if you look at gold versus any of the world's fiat currencies, you see that the fiat currencies are declining. Uh, and, and I think from my recollection, if you go uh, back from 1971, when gold was delinked to the US dollar, the US dollar has declined about 90% relative to gold. So this, the, the more money they print, uh, the more the dollar is going to decline. That, that just uh, almost automatic. Okay, I hope um, that cleared some stuff up for you there. Uh, David, do you have anything to comment of so far? Because there's a few more that I'm going to be reading through here before I uh, announce them. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I have one here. It says, I store my bullion in vaults as well as safety deposit boxes. Um, is this a good plan? I, uh, I have a client, I told him uh, that gold was stored in Switzerland. Is this true? Is Fort Knox empty? The Fort Knox is empty. I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. The best uh, research to do on that is go to a search engine, type in Bill Still, B-I-L-L, Still, S-T-I-L-L, and watch some of the videos he's done on that question. Mm -hmm. uh, safe deposit boxes are not my choice. I prefer doing uh, facilities such as BMG that Nick has. I also, and that's mostly for good sized retail and uh, institutional type investors. Uh, on the smaller side, there are private vaults that are available. Um, it used to be much more available in the 70s, but I digress. So there are places, but I would not want to put my uh, precious metals in a bank in a safe deposit box. Now that sounds extreme, but under extreme conditions, the bank has the right to go in the United States. I don't know the Canadian law and actually open up the um, your safe deposit box. So there are other ways to store it outside of the banking system, which is you know what Nick started way back when. So the R facilities, you just got to think, really when you think gold, you got to think crisis. Uh, I don't like to be a big doomer. I like to be a realist, but I knew from an early age that we'd probably see the day that we're living in. Not the exact way we got here, but that we would get here. And here we are. So when you think reality and that these things happen throughout modern, you know, throughout human history, you need to be prepared. And when that lifeboat that you have is not the right one, and you find out it's a synthetic substitute or derivative of the real thing, you're going to be vastly disappointed that you made the right decision, but picked the wrong vehicle. I think I just have to warn everybody. That's the, the thing that a lot of people don't consider is when they store their, their gold in a private vault, they, they have to carefully look at the financial strength of the vault operator. Because in, in a case like that, if the vault operator has a mortgage or if the property is leased, the, the landlord can come in and, and seize all the assets in the vault uh, if there's a default on rent and and the, the investors would lose their gold. Uh, so it's a very careful thing to look at so the financial strength of the vault. The second thing is safety deposit boxes uh, is not a good idea because that you have no proof of what you have in the safety deposit box. So if you come back one day and there's nothing in there, you have no proof, it's not insured. In, in the UK, uh, there was a time when they, the, uh, the authorities raided three safety deposit box facilities, opened up all the vaults, and, and the owners of the vaults had to come in and prove what they had in it and what they were theirs. Uh, in many cases, the owners never showed up. So, so that's not a good idea either. Okay, well, um, that was the final one from the attendees. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have any other questions to ask. Um, we are closing down on the hour. Um, we have a few more minutes left. 
Uh, so I just wanted to update everyone uh, who's online uh, that we do have um, a, com a webinar on Wednesday, Water Cooler Wednesday. Um, and uh, it's where we kind of like just have like a group hug. We just kind of embrace our whole country. Everybody calls into the virtual water cooler. Uh, we have a really good chin wag, as English like to say, and we talk about whatever's on our mind. We do have a special guest uh, tomorrow, uh, John Carson from MNP. Uh, we're going to kind of unpack uh, they, all the emergency funds that seem to kind of be coming out of nowhere uh, through this government and um, also explore and unpack the new rental um, assistance program that has been presented and uh, kind of clear that air and make it less muddy. So please join us for that. Again, that's Don Carson. He's very eye level, very friendly, very, uh, he's not intimidating at all and we can have a really good laugh and cry, I guess would be at the same time. Um, uh, Brian, if you want to close out and hopefully we see everybody sure. again uh, tomorrow at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time for Water Cooler Wednesday. Nick, always so good to hear from you. David, the Silver Guru, wow, you blew me away today. Thank you. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, um, and Jackie, for standing in. Unfortunately, Georgina couldn't make it. Uh, but Nick and David, what a great presentation. Um, it's funny, we're all busy doing our thing and all of a sudden that four letter, that four letter word G-O-L-D comes back in our vocabulary. And you know, in times of crisis, rush to gold, we all hear about this, but actually we had a good discussion today about that. Now, Nick, um, you have, you know, your name is, uh, is, is on there, Nick Baryshev. Just, you know, Google his name, you'll find a lot of articles. Uh, definitely I'd get that book, uh, get the gold bug back into the gold bug and reading get yourself educated find out where this is at because at the end of the day you're saying look at gold and or silver and see where it fits in your uh, investment portfolio which i think is always good to examine what you do have there in light of what's happened david you are doing a number of things with your um, report and your podcast um, tell us uh, if they want to know more for each of you what's the best way to follow you or to contact you and for me, just go to the main landing page, themorganreport.com, and I urge everybody to get on the free newsletter and we'll put out all the information I do for free every week. Excellent. Thank you so much for your hard work and uh, for helping us all out. And Nick, how about yourself? How do they get a hold of you other than getting your book? <laughs> well, our website is bmg-group.com, and okay. um, everything's there, including you can order the book from us as well as the audio CD uh, and a huge amount of uh, articles and reference material. Super quick, uh, this one question just sneaked in. Uh, we have a one minute, two minutes, really quick, super quick. Uh, it's, it's from Dave. He wants to know, David, would you suggest holding William for longer term or consider trading for other asset class at some point after the correction? Well, I'm long term. I mean, personally, you know, I plan on passing on some to my kids as a legacy. And, you know, if I'm wealthy enough at the time, uh, may start a foundation for education and economic affairs or something like that. But it's a personal choice. I really sure. can't answer that question for you. You have to decide on your own, really. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a wrap, everybody. Thank you very much for a great hour. And we'll see you the next time. Thanks, David. Thanks, Nick. Thank Thanks, Jackie.